My name is Roy Blight, and this is part seven. This is the church at Laodicea. This is the, the culmination of the wake up call series that I've been teaching. Laodicea is the seventh church. And as we study its, its place in the seventh church, this is really one of the most important, if not the most important church to discuss, because this is the culmination of things that have taken place during the last seven years. Remember the final Shemitah, the final seven years given to the children of Israel is what this has been all about. <clears throat> and we are discussing in this in this series the, the state of the church that is there in the last seven years. And as we begin looking at this, remember, as we discuss on season of the shofar, all of our videos, all of our presentations are meant to draw you to Jesus, to draw you to Yeshua, to help you understand the days and the hour you're living in. We're blowing the shofar. We're this this uh, couple days ago we had Yom Teruah, which is the day of the awakening blast, and we want to sound the shofar as loudly as we can. We want to sound the trumpets as loud as we can to get people's attention because we're living in the final days. We're heading in to the, some very important years. And these last seven years, the wake-up call years, these are the final days that in which we have before Jesus, literally, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, comes back. And as we look at this, this whole teaching, we see now that the context of the, of the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation are discussing the state of the church at seven various points of the last seven-year period. It may not be seven years, but seven stages or seven places on the way to the coming of the Lord where the church is at. And it's going to be a time of great change. It's going to be a time of great upheaval. It's going to be a time that is going to be horrific for the world because the world is falling into the judgment hands of an angry God. And we find that the Lord is going to save those that are his and those that are not his. They're going to suffer the penalty of the judgment of the hand of God because it's pronounced in the scriptures that way. So as we look at now the, the, the last seven years, we're looking now at the last one, Laodicea. And remember last week, we had two, two presentations about the church of Philadelphia, which was the sixth church. And as we look at the sixth church, we realize this is the time. There will, there, there will be a time in in the days ahead, when, when Jesus comes back, the rapture is the day of the Lord's return. This is the day of the Lord. This is what we were all waiting for. This is what we want to have as the culmination of everything that we are about. So as I, so as I begin this today, we want to understand exactly where we stand with the Lord. You want to understand exactly where you stand at the Lord. But when we look at the congregation that was at Ephesus. This is the beginning of the seven years, and this is where you need to determine that your first love is Jesus, and that although you hate all the falseness and the lies that are around you, you're going to serve the Lord. And then we had the church at Smyrna, which we discuss as, as the, the beginning of sorrows happened. Then the church of Thyatira, the abomination of desolation takes place at the midway point when this happens at the temple in Jerusalem. And then we find also where the martyrs are dealt with. The Lord is talking to the martyrs and those have, that have lost their lives for their faith in Jesus. And they're, they're crying out, oh, Lord, when are you going to come back? And he says, not until all of my people that have died, this have been martyred for me, are all done. And then we find that in the sixth church, which we discussed, this is the church at Philadelphia. This is the church, the, the present age of the time of those who go in the rapture and those who don't go in the rapture, which leads us in today's uh, teaching about the church at Laodicea. This is the left behind church. There will be believers who are left behind. And this is who this letter is written to. And it's all about Daniel's 70th week, the prophesied last Shemitah before the coming of the Lord, the last seven-year period that the Lord has given, given letters and he's given pointers to and he's given directions to, all of those that are his that will call upon his name. And this is year seven. This is right at the end of the tribulation. Jesus is on earth now, and Jesus is judging all his enemies. Jesus is destroying all his enemies. And we find that great judgment is happening everywhere. And there will be those who are left behind at the rapture who will be saved. 
And you wonder how many there were. I don't know how many there are. And that doesn't seem like there's going to be too many, but they will have the opportunity to come to the Lord. In fact, this is also the time when many unbelieving Jews come to know Jesus because they realize that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the, the man of the Lord. He is the one that was sent for our salvation. So as we look at this, this is part one today. This week and next week, we're discussing uh, the church at Laodicea again. This is the last seven years, the wake-up call years. Now, let me give you a quick little overview, a little uh, uh, go back and, and catch up to where we are. The seven seals in the book of Revelation in, in chapter uh, six, and they talk about, and they discuss these last seven years as well. It's, a, it's like a template. There's the white horse. This is the beginning of the last seven years. Then there's the red horse. Then there's the black horse and the pale horse, which in actuality is the green horse. It's a light, a pale green. It's chloros in the Greek. And this is the beginning of sorrows. This brings us up to the time of the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist will be in Jerusalem declaring that he's God. And that's when all hell really breaks loose and takes us into the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. And these seven letters that Jesus gives to these seven congregations correspond with these seals. And you see that the Lord is trying to call out those who will be overcomers during the times and the trials that they're going in during the times of the last seven years. Now, again, we're way, we're way into the second half of the Great Tribulation now. And we find at the Church of Philadelphia, the rapture indeed does happen. Jesus is now on planet Earth. He's destroying his enemies, and there are those who are believers who have been left behind. And again, remember one thing, that the author of these letters is the Lord himself, Yeshua HaMashiach. He wrote these letters. He's not giving you a play-by-play -play of what's going to happen. He's writing to his people who are going to be overcoming during this time. And this is, a lot has happened now, but we've gone through almost a full six and a half, six, seven years, whatever it's going to be. No man knows really the day or the hour it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And this is the countdown to the end when Jesus comes and reigns reigns and rules from Jerusalem during the last seven years, during at the end of the time when he comes back and he's going to reign and rule for a thousand years. This will be the trigger point of the uh, millennial kingdom that we're all looking forward to. And the prophet Daniel spoke heavily about this time. In Daniel's 70th week, there's been 70 weeks that were given to uh, Israel, and there's 69 of those weeks have gone. And it prophesies the coming of the Messiah when he came the first time. And now there's seven years left, one week left, that Israel must endure during this time to come to know their Lord. And it's during this last seven years, the Lord is going to open the eyes of many Jewish people to know that Jesus is their Messiah. Messiah. There's many Jewish people today that are coming to the Lord. There's Messianic congregations that are popping up all over uh, the Western world and all over Israel, as a matter of fact. It's happening now. It's beginning to happening. But with, during the times of this tribulation, this upheaval, you're going to see the Holy Spirit moving in miraculous ways, saving the people who will be saved. So this is Israel's final week. It's the last seven years, the wake up call years. One thing to keep in mind is, is that during this time, you're going to find that the spirit of Antichrist, which is in, in the world even now, the spirit of Antichrist is going to be dominant. The spirit of Antichrist is going to set it up for the man of sin to come forward that we're, we've talked about at the time of the abomination of desolation. There will be a man of sin, the man of perdition, it's called in scripture. He will proclaim himself to be God. He will be the Antichrist. And all the people that are with him, those that are against Jesus, all those that are against the church, they're against Judaism, they're against the Torah. You can tell the spirit of Antichrist has been in the world for thousands of years now, but now it's really going to be coming to a head. And it culminates after three and a half years of time at the abomination of desolation, which will happen in Jerusalem. It'll happen at a reconstituted temple that is set up in Jerusalem that is going to be the temple of the Antichrist, and he's pro going to proclaim himself to be God. And when Israel and the believers that are there who have been duped realize that this is not the Messiah, that is when all hell breaks loose, and this is when the Antichrist decides to kill everyone 
who is opposed to him, and there's going to be a bloodbath. There's going to be great uh, persecution of all believers, and this is promised, and this is talked about uh, a lot in Scripture. Now, the world at this point in time, at three and a half years into the last seven years, has moved quickly and violently into the last three and a half years, and it's known again as the Great Tribulation. The whole seven years is, is referred to as the, the tribulation period, but the great tribulation is in actuality the last three and a half years. If you remember at the fifth seal, when we talked about the church at Sardis, we talked about how the believers who have been martyred for their faith are going to be given white robes, and they're told to wait a little bit longer until those others that need to be martyred are, are there with them. We find out that the heart of the Lord is there for his people, and he's trying to encourage his people through these seven letters, and he wants you and I to be overcomers so that we can uh, go through these days and understand what he's trying to say and do to his church because the whole world is going to be going through the judgment of the Lord. The Lord's judgment is going to be all over planet earth at this time and only those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No other religion, only those who call upon Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach will be saved. Only his blood saves. Only the work that he did at the cross the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord that happened at Passover 2,000 years ago will matter. And it's our faith in him that's going to see us through. Everything else is vain. Everything else will fall way short. Everything else is in the prison house of Satan, even right now. And we see now that late in the day here, late within the late later part of the Great Tribulation, the rapture takes place. Those that are fall, those that are with the Lord, those who are overcomers, those who are the bride of Christ, the elect, they will be raptured. But there's going to be many who are not raptured. There's going to be many who say that they're believers, but were really uh, fooling themselves, who are not really followers of Jesus. They say they are, but they've not really been able to follow anything because they've not been taught or they've decided not to follow him. Whatever the reason, they've not been overcomers, even though they consider themselves to be believers. This church at Laodicea. This is the church of the left behind. This is the those that are left behind because they weren't following the Lord. These are the half-baked baked lukewarm believers that are many among us even right now that we're trying to get a hold of. Now, the church at Philadelphia represents the sixth seal in which the true followers of Yeshua the Messiah are taken from the earth. This is the rapture. But we remember the open door that, that was discussed at the, with the Church of Philadelphia. The door was open for the five virgins to enter through, and then the door was shut so that the five foolish virgins could not enter in. Well, this door is still shut as we enter into this discussion of the church at Laodicea. The door is shut, but now Jesus is knocking at the door. Again, this is Laodicea, this is the seventh church, and this is the seventh seal. And this is the church of the left behind. This is the ones that have been left behind, and now they're crying out for salvation. They realize what is at stake. The reality of their situation has hit them, and now they want to repent. And that is a good thing, because for the last six, seven years, during this time, there's been a complete rise in persecution all around the world. You know, some places around the world have lots of persecution, even right now. But it's growing, especially in the West. It's growing. You see it uh, starting to uh, unloose itself in, in every fabric of our society. But it's going to get much worse. And we see this is part of the scenario of these last seven years. Now, remember that the lives of all believers in Yeshua the Messiah will be targeted at this time. And remember that these seven letters are all written to all believers at the specific point in time represented in the last seven years. If you can keep this in your head, you can see it in context, and it makes perfect sense for where the church is at the certain time of the last seven years. And these, these seven letters are very frank, and they're very in context, and they're very personal for those who are alive during the last seven years. Remember, the first one, F the church at Ephesus, was all about identifying the false prophets. He says, you, I know that you, you hate those that are false prophets and that are liars among you, but he tells us that we must return to our first love. 
In order to go through this time, this great upheaval of these last seven years, you need to have a relationship with Jesus, the Messiah. You, you do anyway, but you need to understand that your first love is where you need to be. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, if you don't return to your first love of how it was when you were first born again of the Spirit and came to the Lord, you're not going to really make it because there's going to be a great falling away. And many people are going to fall away rather than be put to death. Then, then things start to deepen. And the church at Smyrna shows us all about war breaking out and persecution exploding on the earth and all kinds of pestilences and things happening. This is the second seal. This is also the red horse. Ephesus is the white horse. Smyrna is the red horse. Then you get to the church at Pergamos. And it sees the persecution deepen, but also has a reference concerning food. It also has, a, this is the black horse, which is also talking about the economy of the world collapsing and the economy breaking down. So there's great upheaval as far as what people are going to eat. And this is also discussing cryptically in this church all about spiritual food and physical food. And this is getting deeper and deeper. This is like the third year, the third stage of the last seven years. Then right in the middle, we have the church at Thyatira, which introduces the great tribulation. And the church at Thyatira shows us the abomination that causes desolation. Somewhere in here, we're probably going to see the mark of the beast as well. But this is the fourth seal. And this, this fourth horse, which is the pale horse, or in actuality, it's the green horse. This is the horse that represents death. And death and upheaval are going to be everywhere about. And then we got to the fifth seal, the martyrs of the great tribulation. They're the subject of the church at Sardis. And we've just discussed this. It says in Revelation 6, 12 through 17, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sack sackcloth of hair, and the moon became his blood, and the stars of the heavens fell unto the earth. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, and she is shaken of a mighty wind. This is God's wrath coming to planet Earth. You see, when Jesus comes in the clouds and the rapture takes place, those believers that are truly his will be raptured out of here, thank God. But everyone else will be left behind. And it also says that everyone is going to behold him. And those that are his enemies are even going to see him. And that's when the true wrath of God truly begins. Up to this point, you have the wrath of the Antichrist, which was bad enough. But now you have the wrath of God coming to earth to destroy all his enemies. And it needs to be established whose side you're really on. You're either for Yeshua or you're against him. It says in Revelation 8, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now you see the context of the seven trumpets in Revelation. It happens when the Lord is coming back. And there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Then verse 3 says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. I find this an amazing thing that all the prayers of all the saints over all the years have been collected now. And they're part of the wrath of God. They're part of the judgment of God when he comes back. Remember, this is the day of the Lord's vengeance. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquakes. Yes, this is the beginning of the wrath of God. This is the beginning of, for the church, what is known as the hour of trial. If you're still here, it's going to be an hour of great trial. You're either going to truly come to the Lord, or you're going to be judged along with the rest of the world. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. It's happening. Yeshua's here, the judgment's beginning, and the, the great war to end all sin, to end death, to end sickness, everything, to end everything that's an enemy to Christ is ready to take place. And this is all, this all happens. This, all of this war that's ready to take place his shoe was back now and he's getting he's marshalling any forces he has he really doesn't need anybody but everything's set up for the war 
And in the middle of all this, you see there's the remnant church. There's those who are now wanting to be with the Lord. There are those who said, oh, Lord, I'm sorry I missed it, and now I want to repent. With the sixth letter to Philadelphia, we see that relief comes to a portion of those who call themselves the church or the body of Messiah. It's Actually, it's going to be kind of few people that really get raptured. It's going to be a smaller percentage than many people think. However, this relief does not come to everyone. Some of them, believers who are not, for whatever reason, are not there with the Lord, they are left behind. They are the remnant that are here during the wrath of God. What happens to those who remain on earth? That's the question. Now, this is dealt with in the seventh seal, and it's dealt with in the letter to the seventh church, to the believers at Laodicea. But remember, this is the Lord being frank with them because they're there because they weren't fully engaged with the Lord in the first place. Now, despite what modern churches teach about salvation or about saying the sinner's prayer and going in the rapture, Yeshua himself paints a very different picture. And we want to see this because everything is going to be exposed. Everything that's out there is going to be very plain. And when the rapture takes place, those who are playing games and those who aren't really living for the Lord, who say they're Christians, many of them go to church who have had this, this false security all these years that they belong. It's not happened. Now they have to face the reality of their situation. And we understand that uh, there's many things in the scriptures that talk about this. The, for example, the wheat and the tares. Wheat and tares look very similar. And it takes an experienced eye to discern between wheat and tares. And many of our churches are filled with the wheat and filled with the tares. The wheat are going to make it. The tares will not. Many of the Lord's parables speak of the righteous being separated from the wicked. However, the wicked are not who people imagine. We, we see, oh, that's a sinner because he's robbing banks or he's killing people. But in God's eyes, it's very different. The wicked, spoken of by the Lord, are often not the idolaters and the adulterers and the murderers. In the parable of the ten virgins, all ten of them are looking forward to the return of the bridegroom. All ten of them are virgins trying to keep themselves pure. All ten of them have lamps, but only five get into the wedding feast. This is something we need to pay attention to. Now, in the, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the tares look exactly the same. And we see that a discerned eye can tell because of the wheat, when it matures, starts to bend over at the top because of the weight that it's carrying. But the tares do not. They stick up proudly and they stick up and they're not carrying any fruit at all. So wheat and the tares are a very great picture of who is going to go in the rapture and who is not. The righteous and the wicked to us look exactly like you and me. And the reapers, who are the angels, are appointed to work the fields of God's harvest. So we see this, the righteous and the wicked are together, and they look exactly the same to us. The angels may or may not yet be aware of who is who, yet the ones left behind are those who are left outside the barn to be burned when the wheat is taken inside. The will of God is important to understand here. And the angels are looking for those who are truly God's people. How do they make the differentiation? In the Sermon on the Mount, Yeshua instructs that those who hear his words, yet do not put them into practice, will have their house destroyed. This is what the Lord himself said. Obviously, those who hear today are those attending the churches, those sitting right next to us. Some of us are taking it seriously, some are not. Many of us are trying to do what is right before the Lord and are seeking the Lord and have a heart filled with the softness of the Spirit of God in our lives, and others are just showing up for whatever various reasons that you can think of. We all come together. It doesn't mean just because you go to church does not mean you're right before the Lord. You have to understand that the Lord knows the heart of every one of us. So those that are asleep are asleep. Those that are, and I'm not talking about just sleeping, I'm talking about spiritually asleep. They should know better, but they don't understand the things of God, and they're just along for the ride. God knows the hearts of everyone. Who are really the ones in Laodicea is the question, because those that are the elect, those that are the bride, 
have now been taken. They're the remnant. They, they have been uh, they've been raptured. They're not there anymore. But this is all about the reality of those who are left behind. In Matthew 7, 21, the Lord said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. This is a very important scripture for us, and we need to understand. In Matthew 7, 22, the Lord says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Now, you have to understand, this is somebody you would think knew the Lord. Just because you're doing things in the, the Lord, even if you're anointed to do things in the Lord, doesn't mean you actually know the Lord. The next verse says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, many of you who have, have are in congregations where they've basically thrown out the Old Testament, the Torah is the law of God, and the kingdom of God is based upon the Torah, and Jesus is pointing us always to his kingdom, to live in his kingdom, and if you know the Lord, you're going to love his word, you're going to love his law, and many of those, he's going to say, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now notice that Yeshua rarely focused on the unrighteous, but really narrowed his thoughts to those who had heard his words. The Lord is focused upon those, not, not those that are really out there as, as the murderers and the thieves and the adulterers and so forth. He's focusing on those who are in his congregations, those who should know better, those who are hearing the word of God week after week after week, but it's not registering. It's not changing them. It's not doing anything in their lives. These are the virgins that do not have their lamps lit, and they don't have the oil in their lamps. They're kind of there. They think that they're there. They, they believe that they're part of the body. They believe that they're part of everything that's about Jesus, but they're really not. They walk in self-deception, and they, they, when the door is open, they're not ready for what's going to happen. The five virgins that have their, their lamps trimmed with oil and the light is on, they are the ones that are there at the door. And at the proper time, when the door is opened, they walk through, but then the door is shut. Remember it said to the church at Philadelphia, I am the one who, I have the key of David, and I open the door, and I shut the door. And nobody else can shut it, and nobody else can open it. This is the words of the Lord. And people that go in the rapture are those who are ready to go in the rapture spiritually. Those who hear his words, those who hear the words of Jesus, and act on them will be the saved, the ones who go through the door. It's a very important concept. Those who hear his words and do not act on them are not saved and do not go through the door. Even though they're going to church, even though they look to be doing the exact same things as everybody else, they're not saved. They, they hear his words and they don't act on them. It's not enough for you to hear the word. You need to act upon what you hear. You act upon what you believe. And if you don't act upon what you hear, you're not saved. And you won't be going through the door and you'll be left behind. But God is offering you his mercy even then. This is what the church at Laodicea is all about. These are the foolish virgins who are left behind, the tares and the foolish builders who built their homes on the sand. And we see the, the parable of that even. It is to this group of believers that Yeshua HaMashiach wrote the letter to Laodicea. And, make it, and be very clear about this. He loves them, but they weren't there. They were the virgins that were going out doing something else when the door was open, and they missed the rapture. Now, Yeshua tells us about the things that will not save us. One. Calling him Lord alone will not save you. If you're not doing what he wants you to do, how can you even call him Lord? You're kind of messed up in your understanding of everything. Just calling him Lord alone won't save you, won't, won't get you in the rapture. You've, he's not really your Lord if you're not doing what he tells you to do. Two, doing amazing works in his name will not save you. Just because you seem to have an anointing and you go about doing this or that or the other thing, do you really know the Lord? Remember, the scripture says that his sheep know his voice. And it's important that you build your house upon the rock and not upon the sand because the winds of adversity will come and will blow your house away. And this is what we're seeing during this time. 
during the great tribulation. So we see that all of all of God's word is for us, but you have to apply God's word. It's not about just reading or hearing it. You have to apply God's word. God's word needs to mean something to you as the word of God. These are crucial. These are important because these people in Laodicea, those that are left behind, these believers continuously do unrighteous acts or acts of lawlessness because they don't really care what God's word says. They know what it says, but they're going to do their own thing anyway. It says in Revelation 3.15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Now, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? And notice that he's not saying, I know you as an adulterer, or you as some heathen, or you as some bank robber, or you as some murderer. He's not saying that. He says, I know your works, whether you are either cold or hot. What's your attitude about your relationship with the Lord now? Is it cold? Or is it hot? You see, he's not really speaking to the cold or hot because he, he could wish that you were cold or hot. It's easy to judge something that's hot. Praise the Lord. He brings you in. You're the, the bride. And it's easier for him to judge the cold. Those that are against him, that those are enemies, that'll be easy for the Lord. But those in the middle, those are the ones that he's dealing with at the church of Laodicea because they think they're hot and they think they're right with the Lord, but they're lukewarm. And the word lukewarm needs to be an enemy in our spirit because you cannot afford to be lukewarm during this time. And the lukewarm believer, that's the left behind believer. Those who are lukewarm in their faith before the Lord are the ones that are in the greatest danger of being left behind. And the Lord says, I wish you were cold or hot. It's easier. But because you're lukewarm, he's going to spit you right out of his mouth. He says, so then because you are lukewarm, now, those of you that are, that are getting by with a laissez-faire attitude toward your faith in Jesus, if that's you, listen to this. You cannot afford to be lukewarm. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What a disgusting thing the Lord has to say here to get your attention if you're lukewarm. And there's so many lukewarm amongst us. Three groups of people are called out for what they, what they do, the cold. That's the ungodly and the unrighteous who want nothing to do with the issue of the Messiah in the first place. It's easy for the Lord to judge them. It says in Matthew 24, 12 and 13, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. So in this world of coldness, in this world of unloveliness and of unlovingness, we endure to the end in, as people of love. We need to understand the days we live in are going to have a lot of people going toward the world and be unloving and be cold. And, you, and if you're lukewarm now, you're going to end up being in that direction. And then there's the hot. The hot are those who are truly saved, who hear Yeshua's words and do them. And then the lukewarm. This is the one, again, these are the targets of the church at Laodicea. This letter is reaching out to them. The, those who are often the target of Yeshua's teachings, yet are very seldom spoken to from today's pulpits. A lot of people, they go to church, they think they're right with God. They never really hear the gospel. When they do hear the gospel, they're not moved to do anything. They're, they've been going to church, and yet they're spiritually dead. They're, they're, they're going to church, and they think because everybody else is dead, I'm along with them. Listen, if your whole congregation is lukewarm, that doesn't mean that you're okay. That means you're just lukewarm along with them. Again, the lukewarm are the foolish virgins, the tares, and the foolish builders who built their homes on the sand. This is the warning to you. The lukewarm are those who hear Yeshua's words and do not put them into practice. This is The, the Bible is a spiritual book written to people who are born again of the Spirit, who the Spirit of God moves upon and helps us to move in the right direction. It's not a religion, and it's it, it's not some kind of traditional thing. If it is to you, you need to get out of that dead place you're at. They, the lukewarm, are those who sit right next to us during Shabbat services or on Sunday mornings during your church services. They're right there, and many times they don't even discern what's, what side they're on, and they think they're going in the rapture. Just because, by the way, just because you, you know about the rapture, whether you're pre, post, trib, whatever, just because you know about the rapture doesn't necessarily make you right with God. 
Where is your heart before the Lord? Are you lukewarm? Because if you're lukewarm, you're in great danger of being left behind. So the choice is either God or the world. There's no middle ground. There's a lot of people want to sit on the fence, but remember, Satan owns the fence. You've got to be on the Lord's side. You need to be hot on fire for the Lord. And if you're asleep spiritually right now, you're in great danger when the rapture takes place of being left behind. And before the rapture, if you are lukewarm, you're in great danger of falling away from the Lord completely in the first place. Remember, before the rapture takes place, Paul wrote that there must be a great falling away, and then the son of perdition is going to be revealed. A lot's going to happen before this time. Where are you now spiritually? You need to be hot on fire for the Lord. Revelation 3.16 says, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Obviously, the Lord is not looking at your position as anything wonderful, is it? If he's going to vomit you out of his mouth, he's not very happy with your status in the kingdom of God. So understand that this is very graphic, and it's very important for us to understand. Notice how disgusted the Lord of glory must be to use language like spew and vomit. Why would the Lord prefer them to be cold or unrighteous rather than being lukewarm? The hotter the ones, again, right with God and will get their deserved reward. The cold obviously deserve their punishment because they've lived their lives in opposition to Yeshua. The, the, the target here are those who are lukewarm. And if you're not sure, ask yourself, look in the mirror, pray to the Lord, and ask yourself, am I lukewarm? Are you lukewarm? Because this is the church, Laodicea. This is the church that will be left behind when the rapture eventually does take place. However, the lukewarm did not live their life in outright rebellion against the Lord. It doesn't look like they're rebels against the Lord. They think they're right with God. The lukewarm attended church services, they heard sermons, they thought they were saved and would be raptured. These are the five virgins who were foolish. They were not, they were left behind. And so let's look at a little bit, this doctrine that's out there today that is crippling many people and making them cold and lukewarm. And that's, the, that's what we call cheap grace. So let us look at this cheap grace and try to understand how, how uh, disturbing it is and how dangerous it is, how a person can say the sinner's prayer, attend a fellowship, and still be absolutely lost because there's no real heartfelt repentance before the Lord. This is a super important topic, and we want <clears throat> we want to let <clears throat> excuse me we want to let the Scripture interpret the Scripture. So let us first look at the perfect context of this letter to Laodicea being addressed to the left-behind church during the Great Tribulation. Notice that this letter seems to be written to historic believers and could especially apply today to many superficial, backslidden believers who sit in pews all over the world. And we see that they're there, and we have to understand that they, again, they think they're right before the Lord. You know, there's movies out there about being left behind, and, and even Hollywood understands that there's going to be a rapture and there's going to be people left behind. And if you think that you're going to, if you're not preparing your heart to be the bride of Christ, you too, even though you go to church, will be left behind. Now, certainly the topic of the, of the rapture and being left behind, certainly it will apply to many. However, the primary context is still to the people left behind at the time of the rapture. Things aren't over for them, but they still need to get their lives right before the Lord. Why would Laodicea be considered a church at all if it's left behind after the rapture? And that's a very important question. And the answer is because they were churchgoers. They had at one point in time maybe committed their lives to the Lord, but had fallen away. And they think they're still right with God. These Those people are still part of the church. They're still part of the body of Messiah. And because they are part of the body of Messiah, even though they had fallen away, even though they would not been raptured, the Lord still loves them and wants to give them an opportunity to repent and come back to him. And we see this all over. And many people you know, assume that they're right with God. Are you right with God? 
Now take good notice that there is a difference between a churchgoer, a pew sitter, and a true believer. Just because you attend a church doesn't make you right with God. So what actually constitutes being saved? And this is in and this is written within the church at Laodicea. Mark 13:13 13, 13 says, for us who are believers, the words of the Lord, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So it's you don't get saved once and that's it for the rest of the time. You need to endure to the end to be saved. Your relationship with the Lord is a daily thing. It didn't happen when you were 12 and you can do whatever you want until the time you die. It doesn't, it, it, because you were baptized as an infant doesn't mean that you're saved. And if you walk with the devil all your life, those who endure to the end will be saved. And this is important because we must endure to the end. The grace of God is for us who endure to the end. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it's by grace you have been saved. We're saved by grace through faith, it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not about your works, it's about your relationship with the Lord. Does he know you? you first of all, you must believe that you're a sinner. We, it's easy for us because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We must ask the Lord to forgive us. You must acknowledge that that. Jesus is the Son of God, and he's died for your sins. You must acknowledge that. And then third, and a lot of people don't hear this much anymore, you must turn from your sins. You must walk with the Lord. You must learn to despise sins and wrongdoing in your life. The Lord will help you along the way. You're saved by grace. Through faith, the grace of God is lifting you to not walk in sin. And turning from your sins, this is called repentance. And we must live a life cleaned before the Lord. If you want a relationship with the Lord, you're going to want to keep the channel clear so that the Lord can speak to you and you can speak to him. This is genuine repentance. When you read Psalm 51, uh, King David was truly repenting because of his affair with Bathsheba. This is real contrite prayer and repentance before the Lord. How was it when you came to the Lord? Do you think God owed you salvation? He didn't. Understand that this is an important subject. Real faith is believe in Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, as evidenced by turning away from sin into a life of obeying his word and entering into his kingdom and learning how to walk in his spirit and in a relationship with him. The problem in so many of our modern Christian churches and Messianic communities is that they leave off the final part of the gospel, the turning away from sin into a life of truly living for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is our is our goal. It's our essence. It's where we want to be. It's God's spiritual kingdom that lives in us, that is with us, and his spirit guides us through this life, correcting us as we go. But if you don't have that, you're in danger. You're in danger whether you realize it or not. So understand that the Lord wants us to learn to walk with him through this life. He wants us to learn to be with him through this life, and that's through a lifestyle of repentance, forgiveness, and growth. Anything that is not growing is dying. They've Many who are going to be left behind, they've fallen into the deception of thinking they have something they do not actually have. They do not actually have a relationship with the Lord that is real, vibrant, and true to his word, his will, and his wisdom. The Lord wants to show you who he is in this life. And this is why we need to seek the kingdom of God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength so that we can understand that he is real, he's alive, and he's not kidding, and his word is true. Remember that grace is free, but it is not cheap. Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, laid down his perfect life in order for his people to enter into his kingdom. He paid the price for us to live spiritually the way he wants us to live, and it's all there for us. And if you don't taste it, and if you don't have your spiritual eyes open, if your lamps are not trimmed, if there's no light in the lamp, you're walking in spiritual darkness, and you're in danger of missing the rapture. What our Lord has done for us is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's much, much, much more than that. We need to understand that it's not a game. 
and it's something that we need to take very seriously. The times demand that we put our eyes on the Lord and we allow the Lord to get us ready for the days ahead. So we, we give our hearts to the Lord. We walk with the Lord. We don't want to be left behind. We want to make sure that we are the bride of Christ. Remember again, I read before in Revelation 6, 12 and 17. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of the heavens fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This is describing the return of the Lord. The, the, those that are dead will come out of their graves and they're going to be with the righteous dead will come out of their graves and be with the Lord. Then those of us who, are, who remain will go to be with the Lord. And everyone else, the unrighteous, will stay behind. And even though you go to church, you may not be righteous before the Lord. And you'll be left behind to face all of this that is what is happening. Now, the seven trumpet blasts in Revelation are reserved for God's wrath. God's wrath begins at the time of the rapture. God's wrath begins when Jesus comes back. He gets the bride out of the way, but now he is in earnest. This is the day of the Lord's vengeance. This is the day of God's judgment on planet Earth. Revelation 8 says, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Remember, it says there's silence in heaven about a half an hour for about a half an hour. This is an amazing thing to behold, silence in heaven, because everybody's, their attention is looking at the Lord has come back now, and all that's about to take place is about to take place. Our Lord, the Lord our God has heard the prayers of his saints, and now payback is due. Remember, he answers your prayers. Your prayers may have to wait to get answered sometimes, but now he's coming back. The Lord has returned. Payback is due. It says, then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So all this is happening in heaven itself, getting ready for the Lord to come and judge planet Earth. And we see this horrific judgment ready to take place. God's wrath is going to destroy all of God's enemies, human and angelic. It says in verse 4, And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Each one had a, each one had a hand, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Notice that the prayers of the saints are center stage now for the awesome judgment of God on planet Earth. God's wrath will be unlike anything planet Earth, Earth has ever seen before. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it, on, threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. All these are taking place at the behest of the throne of God because God's judgment, his wrath, is coming to all mankind who do not believe. Now this final year or so of the wrath of God is ready to proceed. And the Lord is still knocking on the doors of people's hearts. The remnant that the Lord is wanting to get a hold of, those that had been going to church that were left behind, the Lord is knocking on the door of their hearts. He, they still have an opportunity to get right with God. It says in Revelation 8, 6, So the seven angels, who are the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And even though the seven angels are preparing to sound, the Lord is still knocking at the door of the hearts of those who are his. So we see the, the, the two things are going on. Great judgments about to take place. And you see that he's got his hand and his heart and his care is for the remnant. And this is where we're going to leave it today. But understand that this is very, very serious business before the Lord. And understand that as we look at what is ready to happen on planet Earth, even today, understand that the Lord's love for us is intense. He paid the price for us. He loves us. But he wants us to have his eyes on him. These seven letters, remember, the, the ones that are the overcomers, they're the ones that are blessed. And, of course, if there's overcomers, it, go, it just stands to reason that there are those who will not overcome. And those who are not over, that will not be overcomers, 
they fall in line with the rest of the world and a lot of the judgment that takes place. The Lord is looking for his remnant. He's looking for his people. And he wants you and I today to give our hearts fully to him. He wants us to be hot for him in these days. So again, as we sound the shofar, as we bring this teaching before you today, understand that the times ahead are going to be turbulent. But in the Lord, remember, if you have the Lord in your life, if you have the center of your life in Yeshua, in Jesus, you're going to be fine. The grace of God is going to be strong in your life. In fact, you'll be empowered to do great and mighty things. But you must decide you're going to walk with him all the days of your life. You need to be committed to what the Bible tells you you need to be committed to. Is he your Lord, or are you just walking in a fog? Is he your Lord, or are you one of the five foolish virgins who don't have, there's no, there's no lamp in their life, there's no direction, there's no oil for their lamp, and they have to go out and find it at the worst time possible. This is for all of us to consider. God bless you. We'll, we'll finish next week with part two of the church at Laodicea. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.